If there is one person that pushes the belief that space is fake more than anyone else, it's Level Earth Observer, who, despite his name, insists he's not a flat earther. Fine by me, labour yourself what you want, of course. And recently, he claims to have found some glaring errors in some old footage from NASA. As he says, when faking space goes wrong. Hello all and welcome along to another video with me, Simon Dan. Thanks very much for joining me. Before we start today, a quick reminder to hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. And you too can join the elite club of people who don't fall for nonsense. Perks include smugness and better dinner party conversations. Right, on with the show. We join Level Earth Observer as apparently he's about to show us what happens when faking space goes wrong. This should be interesting. We will forego his intro and get on with the good stuff. Here we go. Remember, for all you fence sitters, my stance regarding this subject of space and the Earth is I simply stand by what's physically true. That way, I eliminate propaganda, shady characters, conceptual ideas. I simply stand by the physical truth of this Earth. That gives me a foundation to see very clearly, okay? The thing is, we already know the truth of the Earth and space. It's well documented and well understood. You're basically closing your eyes and your ears when it comes to all that evidence. The results of what is physically true, go test it for yourself, they highlight to us all. Unfortunately, what we've been told, that the globe is our reality, is exactly the opposite. The globe is physically impossible. And then, of course, when we entertain space, it only gets worse. So let's have a look. The idea that centuries of navigation, GPS, satellite comms, and actual space exploration are somehow all physically impossible is the kind of statement that should come with a laughter warning. How he says that is beyond me. The mission, STS-51, the narrator, Frederick Gregory, who at the time supposedly was a rookie pilot on the space shuttle. Frederick went on to become a NASA administrator. Frederick's narration is great and makes for a wonderful story until you actually cross-reference what Frederick's saying. And when you cross-reference it, it really is incredibly damning and the conclusions we're left with, yeah, aren't great. So let's have a look. We're going to play the full clip. It's what? Just over three minutes. And then we're going to dissect it up and we're going to delve into the conclusions we're left with, which we didn't do previously. And yeah, if you're a space fan or you're someone on the fence, it's time to wake up and smell the coffee. OK, fair enough, Level Earth Observer. Let's have a look at the clip. Our crew patch was designed by the daughter of one of our crew members, Carol Lynn. John Lynn's daughter. Did an excellent job. We were very pleased with it. Our challenger waited out on the pad for us. We were having breakfast. This is the morning breakfast. You notice we carried the motif of the gold and silver team across. The biggest trick about this was eating breakfast with us with those shirts on and then packing them up and get them on board the shuttle so we could have them on board for our crew picture. Exiting the uh, quarters, we all marched off to the, uh, to the van, gave our usual happy wave, and uh, we're ready to go out to the bird. Now, this is the STS-51B mission and was the Space Shuttle Challenger. And it was crewed by Overmeyer, Lind, Taygaard, Thornton, Vanderberg, Wang, and Gregory, who is the narrator of this video. Since I was a rookie on board, I was asked to describe the sensation of this liftoff. Uh, we had had an awful lot of training, a couple of years worth, but nothing fully prepared me for uh, the actual sensation of those main engines starting and then eventually those solid sliding. I'll tell you, this son of a gun really rattles when it takes off. I kept looking out the window and Bob would say, go back to your instruments. <laughs> so the pilot's job is uh, not to observe, but to monitor and make sure that everything works properly. Uh, after we took off, of course, we had a big roll and uh, something very unique in this picture. In this uh, series of shots, we're going right up the eastern coast of the United States. We'll flash back and forth between this outside of the window shot and the orbiter actually from the ground. But uh, I think it was spectacular. This is a very interesting take 
from a space shuttle pilot. If nothing else today, we've all seen something awesome. We can see the horizon come up, we're, then come up, we're right up the eastern coast. I commented to Bob that we have just gone through some clouds. Those clouds we just went through were at 42,000 feet, so you can tell we were really traveling upward. We had a normal throttle back at about 0.8 Mach uh, to maintain our dynamic pressure uh, below our set limit of about 460 feet per second squared, and then we throttled back up to 104 percent. Now, we continue up the eastern shore. That camera, by the way, was mounted at my right shoulder, looking out the window to my right. Unreal views there. Can you imagine sitting in the space shuttle and looking out the window at the Earth? Awesome. That was the Chesapeake Bay. You can see the Chesapeake Bay. Potomac River there into the Washington area. Uh, Delaware Bay, Bay, the Sea Isle coming up on Atlantic City to the right of the screen. The next thing you'll see is uh, Long Island. It certainly doesn't take long to get up there at all. There's Long Island coming up on the right side. You can see Manhattan there. We'll go right on out the tip of Long Island. See the northern and southern shores out there, the Hamptons. And the next the next thing you see is uh, Cape Cod, and all of this is real time. This is how fast we were going. Actually, pretty slow compared to our actual flight when we got up to 190 miles. There's Cape Cod there in Boston. Okay, great, good stuff. Let's see what a level Earth observer has to say about the video. So what I did was identify two very distinguishable landmarks that we saw in the footage. I then measured the distance between those two landmarks. In this instance, it was Delaware Bay on the left and to the beaches of Cape Cod. I measured the distance and then I measured the time travelled between those two points of reference to get some estimation of speed. And what I got was ridiculous. The speeds in the footage Frederick was narrating were 35,000 miles an hour. Essentially 18,000 miles an hour, the footage of the space shuttle that Frederick had told us was real time. But that footage, when we cross-referenced it by measuring two points of reference in the footage, getting an estimate of the speed, the speed we got was 35,000 miles an hour, which is 18,000 miles an hour faster than the space shuttle can go. Right, I'm going to give you a variety of small reasons why this might be wrong, and then one big one. First off, his timing is actually wrong. I timed how long it took to get from Delaware Bay to Cape Cod by it crossing the right window edge. It was more like 40 seconds, not 35 seconds. But that doesn't really affect the speed calculation. This is just more of a point of his accuracy in general. Next, I noticed a very tiny zooming in during the playback. When you zoom in, everything in frame looks bigger, but it also looks like it's moving faster across the screen. We've also got to take into account that the camera's being handheld here. A slight nudge of the camera moves that right window ledge relative to the Earth, and that could shorten the crossing time. You're also not looking directly straight down. At the frame edges, you're seeing features far off at an oblique angle. That means stuff slides faster across the image. We've also maybe got to take into account that Delaware Bay and Cape Cod are at different distances to the camera. And finally, this is ancient footage. There could be some frame rate conversion issues here during playback. But besides all of that stuff, there's one thing that he's not considering human perception. Now the space shuttle orbits pretty closely to Earth compared to its vast size. When looking out the window of the space shuttle, the ground appears to move quickly because nearby objects pass by faster your field of view than further away objects. Even if your actual speed is constant, you could do that same calculation he just did there with areas of the Earth that are further away from your point of view. And you would get a different result. If you take all of this into account, then I postulate that the method that Level Earth Observer used here is not sufficient in determining the speed of the space shuttle in orbit. Just showing how I measured it, I put a visual indicator on the screen, 
starting on, um, at the left of Delaware Bay and then finishing at the beaches of Cape Cod, just showing you how I measured it. Coming up on Atlantic City to the right of the screen. The next thing you'll see is uh, Long Island. It certainly doesn't take long to get up there at all. Here's Long Island coming up on the right side. You can see Manhattan there. We'll go right on out the tip of Long Island. See the northern and southern shores out there, the Hamptons. And the next the next thing you see is uh, Cape Cod. And all of this is real time. This is how fast we were going. Actually, pretty slow compared to our actual flight when we got up to 190 miles. There's Cape Cod there in Boston. So that made for a great narration from Frederick. Like I said, that is until you cross-reference it. And then when you cross-reference it using the two landmarks, the visible landmarks that I was able to identify, and then you put that information in the speed calculator, Frederick's narration is 18,000 miles out, an hour out. And I think I've fairly justified why your calculation is not the best. So the conclusions we're left with regarding this footage, the space shuttle footage from Frederick, who was a rookie NASA uh, space shuttle pilot at the time, who went on to become a NASA administrator. Considering this footage is going 18,000 miles an hour faster than the space shuttle can go, Frederick's telling us it's real time. And of course, he's not realizing that this footage is too fast. That tells us two things. One, Frederick is obviously never sat on the space shuttle. I personally don't think anyone ever has myself, okay? Which is a blatant disregard to the astronauts that lost their lives on the space shuttle, that is for sure. Do they get on the Blue Origin fairground ride? Quite possibly. But I don't think anyone's ever got on the space shuttle. And Frederick's one of the reasons why. He doesn't have a Scooby-Doo regarding the speeds that relate to the space shuttle. The fact you're actually saying this is pure irony, Elio. It really is. So conclusion number one, it's obvious Frederick wasn't sat on the space shuttle. Conclusion number two, it's obvious they have to speed the footage up. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had this discrepancy. They have to speed the footage up. And of course, in this instance, they got it wrong. They sped it up too fast. But I feel the reason they have to speed the footage up, obviously, anyone who's watched the space rockets launch, is because these rockets, particularly the space shuttle, doesn't go fast enough to get into orbit to fit the story and the narrative which we've all been told. Well, that is nonsense. The space shuttle has one of the highest thrust to weight ratios of anything we've ever built. Look, I think we're gonna leave this today from Level Earth Observer. It really is one of the silliest videos he's ever made and that is saying something. I think it's fair to say that nothing was wrong with that video. Let's wrap this one up today then and say we're all done and dusted. Please let me know in the comments below what you thought of this video, especially what you thought of Level Earth Observer's method in determining the speed of the space shuttle there. Thanks so much for watching, it truly is appreciated. If you enjoyed it, please do consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the thumbs up button too. I've been Simon Dan, have yourselves a great day and I'll see you tomorrow for part 11 of debunking the documentary Scamtartica. See you then. <laughs>